Welcome everyone uh, to the penultimate uh, SIP seminar in the fall series. So we have one more after this, uh, which hopefully uh, I'll see all of you there also. But uh, today it's a pleasure to have Professor Lin Yun Jiang uh, from the Department of Statistics at Rutgers University join us. Uh, Lin Yun uh, joined Rutgers recently after getting his PhD uh, from UPenn. Uh, and his research interests are in uh, high dimensional statistics and adversarial problems, robustness and privacy. So uh, it's a pleasure to have him give a talk on the cost of privacy and adversarial robustness in machine learning. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to him. Uh, all yours, Lin Yun. Yeah, thank you so much, Rafid, for the introduction. And also thank you for organizing this uh, wonderful seminar. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to talk about the privacy and the adversarial robustness. Uh, oh, uh, so just one minor remark. If you are from statistics department, you might already uh, heard about most of this talk. So um, feel free to uh, leave if you want. Um, so, um, okay, so now let's start the talk. And um, so nowadays we are in the area of artificial intelligence and uh, many people in maybe almost all of us are surrounded by the benefits of artificial intelligence. But in the meantime, people are also worried about some ethical and the safety is issues brought up uh, by the uh, artificial intelligence. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about two specific uh, terms called privacy and adversarial robustness in machine learning. Uh, both of terms have ma rigorous mathematical definition. So we can do some uh, rigorous theoretical analysis for those two uh, important terms. So I will start the talk with the privacy. And this is a joint work with Tony Kai and Yi Chun Wang from UPenn. So uh, privacy is a new and a challenging problem in the era of big data. In the era of big data, more and more people recently are increasingly concerned that their own private information might be leaked during the data analysis. So this kind of uh, concerns not only draw attention from the media, but also from the government. Um, in 2018, the European Union made a law called the General Data Protection Regulation to try to protect the data privacy of European users. Uh, it was also reported that in the US, the White House is trying to make a federal law such that it can balance between the privacy and the prosperity. So as a statistician, it's also part of our own responsibility to think about this problem. Say, how can we release the data or release the data analysis results in a more private way. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about um, how can we characterize the trade-off between privacy and the statistic utility. Uh, so before we jump into this topic, let's think of say one simple question. Because uh, for most of people nowadays working, for example, in uh, hospitals, um, one way to protect data privacy is that they given they have a huge amount of uh, patient data. So you can summarize them into a big M by P table. Um, what they do is they can, they simply report some summary statistics in very low dimensional way to summarize a huge data table and then report those uh, a few summary statistics. They think this is private um, and it doesn't include any individual information. So the question, the first question I want to ask is do you think this is a private way? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is no. And the one counter example is given in microarray data analysis. In microarray data analysis, it's usually a standard routine to release the so-called MAF, standing for the minor allele frequencies. If you are not uh, familiar with this MAF, you can simply interpret it as the sample mean. Okay. So the sample mean is uh, one single vector, which summarizes a huge data table. Uh, if you might think this single vector is private and there's no individual information uh, in this single vector. Um, 
So, but turns out this sample mean is not private. In 2008, uh, there's a research group in uh, at UCLA uh, led by Professor Homer. So in 2008, Homer's research group shocked the genetic community by showing that the MAFs, the sample mean, are not private. In their article, they claim that they propose some statistical methods with a publicly available reference data set. Okay. So with the, the help of this method, they are able to identify the presence of a certain individual with non-genotype in a mix of DNA samples. So basically, their um, message can be summarized into this single picture. So suppose we have a huge data table consisting of SNPs data set, okay, the DNA samples from all those patients in the study group. And we are only going to release the sample mean MAFs of this big data table. Their paper simply claims that if you know the genotype of a certain patient, okay, so for example, you can know mine by analyzing my hair, then based on only the released MAFs, okay, this single vector, you are able to identify if this person was in the study group or not with a very high accuracy. Okay. So if we can do this, then in some extreme scenario, for example, the study was conducted for all HIV patients, then certainly this is not um, the information that those patients want to share to the public. So this story tells us that releasing the sample mean is not private. But still, this message is very counterintuitive because nowadays still there are many practitioners they simply releasing summary statistics and the thought uh, this can protect the individual information. So to further convince you this is a, this message, um, I, I will show you a real data analysis. So the data set I used is about the heart disease, which consists of 136 patients and uh, about uh, half a million SNPs. When I get this data set, I randomly split this data set into three parts. Okay. So the first part was assumed to be the study sample. Okay. So all those data are sensitive. So uh, we only release, say, the MAFs, the sample mean of the study sample. The second data set was a holdout data set. Okay, we assume uh, this is a test data set, which is disjoint from the study group. The third data set was assumed to be the reference data set, okay, which is publicly available. So basically, all the data are non publicly. So, of course, uh, we also know the sample mean of this publicly available reference data set. Okay. So now we assume we know those two MAFs. The challenge we are going to attack is that, say, now if I randomly draw a sample Y from the first two samples, okay, it's either in the study group or out of the study group, then I want to ask you this question. Say, based on only the two MAFs, okay, based on only those two released MAFs, can you identify if this Y was in the study group or not? Okay. So if we are able to identify this problem, um, then the individual information is leaked, right? So um, let me do this privacy attack. Turns out that the privacy attack is very simple. Okay, we can, for each Y, Okay, for each Y from the first two groups, we can simply compute a so-called Q value for each Y, which is the inner product between this Y and the difference of those two MAFs. Okay, so for each Y, we can calculate a scalar for this observation. Then we plot, we plot different Q values against all different samples. We found that for all y in the study sample, okay, the Q values are, are generally larger than the data in out of the study group. Okay. So that shows that oh, even if you don't know 
the labels of those ones. You are still be able to infer some individual information simply by computing these Q values. Okay, so for a given one, you can compute the Q value for that one. If this Q value is large, then you can claim, okay, this person is in the study group. Okay, and this will uh, attack the privacy of this certain patient. Uh, any questions? So this, uh, I, I have a question. Uh, uh, so this Y is, is, uh, is it like a binary variable or do you have all the information about each individual in oh. D in and D out? Yes, thank you for the question. So here, uh, the Y is about a half a million uh, dimensional vector. So um, Y is the genotype of a certain patient. So it's a very high dimensional vector. So if I may uh, go into the semantics, I guess, is the issue that the sample mean is leaking information or is it really that you have a lot of other side information available that is allowing you to uh, mount this attack? So for example, if the person's genotype wasn't available to you, you won't be able to do anything with the, with the mean. It's, uh, so the, the only site information we use is this MAF from publicly referenced data set. So this is the only site information we used. I mean, and I this see. MAF uh, is released by the uh, study, right? But I, I think uh, I think Wahid's question was more like you do need, so the attack is kind of, the semantics of the attack are, are for example, you, uh, let's take a swab of somebody's saliva from a, 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 a cup oh. that they were just uh, drinking coffee out of. Now you have a sample of their DNA. Yeah, exactly. Can you tell they were in this HIV study? Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Right. So typically this Y is the genotype of a certain person. So uh, in some cases, it's uh, easier to obtain. So for example, you pick up my hair and you can get my genotype. Right. So, and the typically there's nothing to do, say the relationship between my genotype uh, and my presence in one study group. But uh, this uh, story tells us that as long as that study group released, say the MAF, then you can attack my privacy. Got it, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So um, here, here I yeah. have a question here. So yeah, is there a, is there any assumption of the uh, data generative model? Because for your key va uh, Q values, we uh, we can guess that the the genotype is very sparse here, right? Uh, so in fact, uh, the only so uh, certainly we can prove this attack is successful under some model. Uh, in the proof, we don't need to assume some sparsity condition. What we need to assume is all those Ys are uh, sub-Gaussian. So all those samples are generated from a sub-Gaussian distribution. I see, I see, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, thank you. So is this really a consequence of um, the, the length of the, the sort of high dimensionality of Y relative to the very small um, uh, populations that go into these MAFs? Oh, if you were, had, for instance, if you had 10,000 you know, um, people in this study uh, or in 10,000 in the reference, uh, would this attack still work? Is it? Oh, yeah, thank you very much for this. Uh, wonderful question. Yes, so for this specific Q attack, the dimension matters. The, the, this Q attack is only successful when the dimension P is larger than N. Uh, later, I'm going also to show you a theorem showing that when you increase the sample size, uh, the privacy will uh, gradually become negligible. But uh, for in more general case, say P is less than N, uh, there are also some other attacks that can attack the privacy of sample mean. Uh, here, I, I just use one simple example to show that um, sample mean is, uh, is not private. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks. So any more questions on this slide? Okay, cool. So now let me continue. And uh, hopefully now uh, all of you are convinced that a summary statistics is not private. 
So then what can we do? Uh, to adjust this genetic privacy, uh, fortunately, um, in 2013, Steve Feinberg, who, uh, who was at Carnegie Mellon at that time, uh, proposed to use the concept of differential privacy to protect the privacy in genetic data analysis, uh, where this concept differential privacy uh, is a concept of protecting the individual information okay, when releasing some statistical analysis results. Uh, more formally, this uh, privacy definition is as follows. So we start with two parameters, epsilon and delta. We call an output, okay, a released output, m of x is epsilon delta differentially private if and only if for all pair of adjacent data sets, say x and x prime, where x and x prime only differ by one observation. Okay, the distributions of m of x and m of x prime should be quite similar to each other. So this is the formal definition of differential privacy. And what's the consequence of this definition? This definition tells us that given the output m, okay, one cannot differentiate between x and x prime because the distributions of x, uh, of m of x and m of x prime are too similar. Uh, any questions? Good. So now let's see how this inequality imply the similarity between two distributions. So let's consider a, the simplest case, say delta is zero. Okay. When delta is zero, this inequality is reduced to this sandwich inequality. So this basically ref, uh, imply that the ratio of the probabilities of m of x and m of x prime are quite close to one. Okay, so this measures the similarity between those two distributions. In a more general case, when this delta is non-zero, okay, this delta simply offers a relaxation when this sandwich inequality fails to hold. So from this definition, we can see that if you want a very strong privacy guarantee, you can simply take epsilon and delta to be very small, okay, such that m of x and m of x prime are quite close to each other. So typically in practice, we will take epsilon to be a very small constant and the delta say to be of order uh, one to the say one over uh, n to the to some power alpha, okay? inverse uh, polynomial order okay? for some alpha larger than one. So in our previous example, okay, we have shown that the m of x when it equals to x bar, the sample mean is not private. The solution proposed by Steve Feinberg um, is using the Gaussian mechanism developed by the differential privacy community, okay? uh, which is very simple. Basically, when we output an X bar, we want to add a noise. So we add a Gaussian noise. And one, one can prove that after you add this Gaussian noise, the mechanism M of X will be epsilon delta differentially private. Okay. So um, maybe it's the first time you heard about this differential privacy, but in fact, this notion is very, very popular nowadays it and it has been widely deployed by a lot of tech companies and it's all even used in this year's US Census Bureau. Okay. So it's currently a well accepted notion of privacy. So now let's see how the differential privacy pra uh, perform in practice so let's go back to the previous genetic data example. So now, instead of releasing the original sample mean, we release the sample mean with an additional Gaussian noise. Okay. So again, we can perform the Q attack on this newly released output. We found that after the randomization, okay, after you uh, add the Gaussian noise, the Q attack no longer works. Okay, the Q attack computed from this new M of X are totally mixed. mixed. Okay, so this shows that if, if you still calculate the Q values for different subjects, you can no longer tell if a certain person was in the study group or not. Okay, so this shows that the Gaussian mechanism helps to protect the individual privacy. Okay, uh, any questions?
Okay, cool. So um, this shows that the, the strength of using the Gaussian mechanism. But if you are careful enough, you might wonder, say, uh, how much noise should I add? Right? So if I add too little noise, then the result will look like this, and the uh, final output is um, not private enough. On the other hand, if we add too large noise, okay, then certainly the output will be private, but the output might be useless because it's uh, pure noise. So therefore, a fundamental question in differential privacy is that since randomization costs statistical accuracy, so given the certain level of privacy constraint, what is the best statistical accuracy that we can achieve? Okay. So this is a fundamental question in differential privacy community. And in this, in the first part of this talk, I'm going to uh, give you some insights how to uh, adjust this problem. Okay, uh, any questions? Okay. Um, so in the first part of this talk, uh, because of the time constraint, uh, I will start with the problem formulation. And then I will show with you some some of my recent work on deriving the trade-off between privacy and accuracy in the class of high dimensional generalized linear models. Okay. So now let's start from the problem formulation. Um, so in statistics decision theoretical framework, uh, typically we start from A and ID samples. Okay, those samples or those observations are drawn from a population, say P. For this distribution P, uh, we usually have some parameter of interest that we want to estimate. And we denote it by theta of P. And given the data set, okay, the job of our statistician is to creating estimators, the theta hat, such that the theta hat is close to the theta of P uh, under some loss function. Okay? And here we also denote the theta hat by M of X. Uh, it's an L estimator based on your data. Now, because of the privacy concerns, we constrain the output M of X to be epsilon delta differentially private. Okay, So that when you release this M of X to the public, other people cannot attack the privacy of the individuals in your training data. Okay. So because of the privacy constraint in this talk, we are going to analyze this constraint minimax risk where the inferior is taken over all possible epsilon delta differentially private algorithms. Okay. So uh, this constrained minimax risk is slightly different from the standard minimax risk that was widely studied in statistics. The difference is here, this inferior. And also because we take inferior over a smaller class of algorithms, okay, so typically it takes inferior over all possible algorithms but here, because of the privacy constraint, we take inferior over a smaller set of algorithms. So as a result, the, this constraint minimax risk will be generally larger than the standard minimax risk, right? because we take inferior over a smaller set. Okay. So in this talk, because this constraint minimax risk is larger, so the difference over term it as the privacy cost Okay, this difference is induced by this additional privacy constraint. We are going to analyze both the upper and the lower bound of this constrained minimax risk. Typically, an upper bound will tell you how good an algorithm is, okay, and a lower bound will tell you what's the fundamental difficulty of this specific problem under the privacy constraint. Uh, in the ideal case, we will have matching upper and lower bound. In that case, we will, uh, we will say that this algorithm is optimal. Okay. The, the convergence rates is the optimal one. So now uh, let me start the literature review first. So the optimality or the upper bound and the lower bound of estimation is well studied in the statistics literature and uh, also computer science literature. So in the non-private setting, um, the mean estimation problem and the generalized linear models, their estimation problems are well studied and the optimality or the optimal rate of convergence have been established as shown here. Okay, 
So here, the high dimensional means we have we uh, have sparsity structure in the parameter space, and here the S denotes the sparsity. Okay, so you can see that even in the non-private case, uh, the classification problems okay, here LDA refers to the linear discriminant analysis, which is uh, one type of classification problem. We see that in the non-private setting, there are still some blanks in the classification problem. So the, the reason is that the estimation problem is well studied. Okay, so unlike the estimation problem, in the classification problem, we are more interested in the misclassification error. Okay, uh, the analysis of those misclassification error turns out to be very different from the analysis of estimation errors. So that's why the optimality of classification problems are not well studied in the literature. Uh, this problem is only solved uh, last year um, by our paper uh, on the high dimensional LDA. In this paper, we establish the optimal rate of convergence for classification problems. Uh, now let's uh, take a look at the private setting. In the private setting, you can see here um, for the upper bound, there are a few upper bounds obtained in the literature for the standard mean estimation and the generalized linear models. Okay, so the, the upper bound is like this. And there is also a lower bound uh, established in the literature for the mean estimation. Okay. Uh, by comparing those two rates in the mean estimation problem, you can see there's still a very slight gap between the upper and the lower bound. And you might want to say uh, which direction is not tight. So in our paper, uh, we propose a general framework to construct the lower bound for all these problems. And if you apply our lower bound to this specific mean estimation problem, um, you will get a tight bound, okay, a bound matching the upper bound. And uh, moreover, uh, we can also use the general framework to establish lower bound for all the other problems and obtain those different rates. Uh, meanwhile, in um, uh, our recent works, we also establish different differentially private algorithms that can match those lower bound. And we have different algorithms that is able to get uh, different upper bounds that are optimal. Okay. So all the blue parts uh, are my contribution and uh, the results are in those three papers. Uh, now, because of the time constraint, I'm only going to focus on the high dimensional generalized linear models. Uh, so any questions? I had a quick question about your LDA. Uh, do they, those results, are they only for binary or uh, a general? Uh, oh, so uh, we allow multiple classifications, but the number of classifications K uh, should be bounded. So it's learned to grow with the sample size A and the P. OK. And, and uh, is the result for QDA significantly different or, or not derivable from this that you, oh, yeah. you Thank have you only for mentioned the LDA? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, so I mentioned uh, LDA in our one paper. In, in fact, we have also uh, a, a new accepted paper, which is on the QDA. And we also have the optimal convergence rate. But the rate is uh, very different from the LDA. Um, okay. It's more complicated. I get it. OK, mm. thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. OK, so now let's talk about the privacy um, or, or the private generalized linear models in the high dimensional setting. So uh, to start, let us review what is the generalized linear models. The generalized linear models assume that the response y given x follow the, this uh, so this so-called uh, exponent, natural exponential family. Okay? Uh, and this natural exponential family is parameterized by different functions, a, g, star, and c. So if you take different forms of these functions, you can recover many popular uh, statistical or uh, machine learning models. For example, if you take say h, g, psi, and c equals to those quantities, you will recover the linear regression. So uh, on the other hand, if you take uh, those functions to be a different uh, functions, then uh, it can recover the, the logistic regression. Okay. Uh, moreover, this class of models include the Poisson regression, multinomial regression, and the exponential regressions. 
And so this is um, a general class of, uh, this model covers a general class of statistical models. Okay. So in this talk, uh, for the simplicity of presentation, let me uh, simply focus uh, on the high dimensional linear regression setting. Okay. So uh, here we assume that um, the, the y and the x has a linear relationship and uh, the parameter of interest in our class is the linear coefficients of beta. And also because we consider the high dimensional setting, so we further assume this beta is as sparse. Okay. And uh, we consider the estimation problem and are interested in the L2 uh, estimation error between M of X and the beta. Okay. So this is the setup. Uh, the method of the generalized linear models is largely the same, especially for the upper bound, although the lower bound is very, very different. Uh, if you are interested, you, we can talk more afterwards. But uh, uh, at this, in this talk, I, I will only talk about the linear regression setting. So uh, any questions? Okay, so now let me continue. In the non-private setting, okay, uh, this high dimensional linear regression problem is well solved by the Lasso problem, okay, by the famous Lasso method, uh, which is simply try to minimize the sum of squares with an additional uh, L1 penalty. Okay. And uh, in the statistics literature, the convergence rate or the optimal convergence rate of this beta hat is well studied and people found that the optimal rate is square root S log T over N. Uh, here the S is sparsity, D is the dimension. Uh, and in the sample size. Okay. So now let's think of how can we make the lasso estimator private. Uh, in the literature, there are already many methods proposed to make the lasso algorithm um, um, private. So those methods include, say, uh, the the objective perturbation. Okay. Uh, Anand also has very nice contribution along the, those directions. Uh, and also, the, there are also methods, some other methods working to perturb the gradient. Uh, but most of them are only focus. Um, I can say all of them only focus on establishing upper bounds on the excess risk. Okay, uh, no optimality results so far in the literature are shown for the estimation error. If our goal is, uh, or if our interest is trying to estimate this beta, what is the optimal error? what is the optimal rate of convergence? This problem is still uh, unknown in the literature, okay? So uh, now in this paper, in our paper, we are going to propose a new method that, that is able to estimate this beta uh, with the optimal rate of convergence, okay? So uh, before we introduce our algorithm, let me introduce uh, one algorithm in the non-private setting that can approximate the lasso estimator very well. So this algorithm is called uh, the iterative hard thresholding pursuit. And this algorithm is also developed by the uh, by a Rutgers statistics group uh, in 2013. Uh, this algorithm, the idea is quite simple. It's simply a modification of the gradient descent method. So in each iteration of this method, we simply run the gradient descent once and then after we run the gradient descent, we do a truncation. We truncate the uh, beta hat to only keep the S hat largest entries okay, and set all the remaining entries zero, okay? So people can show that this uh, iterative hard structure holding algorithm can achieve the optimal rate of convergence in the non-private setting. So now let's think of how can we make this algorithm private. Uh, one naive way is what people typically do uh, in the privacy literature is adding a noise to the gradient. Okay. So um, in this case, in order to make the algorithm epsilon delta differentially private, we should add a noise uh, with this scale in the variance. Okay. So of course, after you add this noise, uh, add this variance, you will find that uh, the resulting estimator, the final beta hat, will be epsilon delta differentially private. However, after a more careful analysis, we found that 
this naive estimator is not rate optimal. The reason is that when we try to add this noise, the scale depends linearly on the dimension d. Okay. But in contrast, the final estimator only has the at most s hat non zero entries. So in order to make the final estimator private, in fact, we don't need to add this much large noise. So this inspires us that instead of making the first step private, we should make the second step private. Uh, Anand, do you have questions? Yeah, quick question um, mm -hmm. about the previous version. This It's also making a stronger privacy guarantee, right? Because you're saying per iteration, mm -hmm. you're I mean, this is this is requiring that every iteration of your of your estimator be differentially private, which seems wasteful because all you want is the final. All you want is that the final answer be differentially private. Yeah, very good question. So typically, uh, for this kind of algorithm, the number of iterations is a log of n. So because the number of iterations is is not that large, so uh, we relax the requirement a little bit and uh, ask, say, for each iteration. Um, the output is uh, is it private? Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Okay, so now let's uh, think of say how can we make the second step private? Uh, to make the second step private, uh, so this will reduce the problem to a simpler problem. Say how can we select the top k elements? from a d-dimensional vector in a private way. Okay. So this problem, in fact, is uh, already solved in the privacy community. So uh, let's see how do they do that. Uh, in the simplest case, say one k is equals to one. Okay. So this is the famous private max algorithm. Uh, this algorithm is very simple. So suppose we want to report the largest entry from this d-dimensional vector. We can simply add ID Laplacian noise to all those d entries and then report the maximum of this noisy vector. Okay, we can show that uh, this noisy report max algorithm is epsilon delta differentially private. Uh, in the general case, when k is larger than one, okay, we can simply repeat the, pri the, the previous private max algorithm k times okay, until we found the largest k entries. So uh, this process can be described in a simple way. So suppose we want to report the top k elements from this d-dimensional vector privately. Okay, we can simply use the private max algorithm once, okay, found the maximum privately and remove it. Then for the remaining vector, we reuse the private max algorithm again. Okay. Um, found the second max, remove it. Okay, we can simply repeat this proce process until we found the k largest elements. And in our paper, we can prove that this private peeling algorithm is also epsilon delta differentially private. Okay. So now uh, with the help of this private peeling algorithm, we can simply replace the second step by this private peeling algorithm. And we can show that after this simple replacement, the final estimator m of x, y, the beta hat is rate optimal with rate of convergence captured in this uh, quantity, okay? So uh, as a remark, uh, I want to emphasize that uh, this algorithm is the first differentially private algorithm in the literature for the high dimensional linear regression and uh, we have the optimality guarantee, okay? Um, so now let's see um, how can we interpret this result, okay? Um, the lower bound proof is actually very uh, hard, uh, at, at least in my opinion. So if you are interested, we can talk more offline, but I'm not going to spend the time to discuss the lower bound here. Okay. But uh, this is an optimal rate. So now let's see, how can we interpret those two terms? So the first term in the convergence rate is the standard non-private statistical risk. Okay, So if you still remember the convergence rate of non-private lasso, this is exactly the same. Okay, so this is a non-private statistical risk. The additional term here, okay, the additional term in the convergence rate is termed as the privacy cost in our paper. We found that uh, this term is added because of the privacy constraint. Okay, so in some special case, 
Okay. If you really want a very strong privacy guarantee, you will take epsilon and delta to be very small. Okay. In this case, the privacy cost will dominate the statistical risk. Okay. So the, in this very extreme case, we will see that the statistical accuracy is compromised by privacy. But fortunately, there's a more interesting case that is in practice, okay, as I mentioned, people simply take epsilon to be a very small constant and delta to be say one over n squared. Okay. In this frequently used setting, we found that as long as the standard lasso estimator, okay, the non-private lasso estimator is consistent up to a log factor, okay, as long as the non-private estimator is consistent, then the privacy cost will be dominated by the statistical risk. This means that we can gain privacy for free in terms of convergence rate. Okay. So uh, another remark I want to make is that this theorem suggests that the epsilon delta differential privacy is compatible with high dimensional problems. Okay. So even if you have a very large dimension D, much larger than the sample size, we can still have a consistent result as long as we assume some sparsity condition. Okay, this is in contrast with a JASA discussion paper uh, published in 2018. In that paper, they found that under the so called alpha local differential privacy constraint, okay, even the, a simpler problem, the mean estimation, is impossible as long as the sample size d is larger than the sample size n. So even if you assume some sparsity condition under the local differential privacy constraint, the problem is still impossible. Okay, so the LDP constraint is incompatible with high dimensional problems. And here we, we found that the epsilon delta DP is, is compatible with high dimensional problems. The reason is that um, the epsilon delta DP is a relaxed version of the LDP. LDP is more stringent. So the LDP is so strong such that it's, it's, it becomes incompatible with the high dimensional problems. Uh, now let us see a simulation result. So here um, we plot the error curves for different methods. The green curve here is the um, LDP, the, the algorithm with the LDP constraint, the local privacy constraint. And we found that it's not consistent at all in this high dimensional setting. The purple curve here is the naive algorithm. It's the naive algorithm. And we found that uh, if you only perturb, say, the gradient, okay, you will have a very large error. The, the red curve is the error of our proposed rate optimal algorithm. So you will find that this error curve is very close to the non private lasso estimator. And moreover, if you look at the future, you will see that when you increase the sample size, the gap, the privacy gap is becoming smaller and smaller. Okay, the reason is that if you look at the, those two convergence rate, the statistical risk scales with the sample size with the rate root n. Okay? In contrast, the privacy cost scales with the sample size with an inverse linear rate. Okay, so this difference implies that when you increase the sample size, the privacy cost will be gradually dominate, dominated by the statistical risk. The privacy cost will be smaller and smaller when you increase the sample size. Okay. Um, so this is uh, all I want to talk about the privacy. Uh, now uh, I will spend maybe five minutes to briefly talk about the cost of adversarial robustness which is another important problem in machine learning. Uh, so this is a joint work uh, with Cynthia's work at Harvard and her students. So um, before the technical details, uh, let me talk about uh, briefly about the motivation. Okay, what is an adversarial attack and what is the uh, adversarial robustness? So um, nowadays, many tech companies uh, use very powerful deep learning models to screen some violent images. Okay. So for example, if this is a gun, um, then the 
algorithm will detect this gum and uh, will label it as uh, violent, something like that. So um, given an image, okay, typically a deep learning model can accurately classify the label of this image. But one surprising thing uh, were recently discovered uh, in the deep learning community, which is that they are able to add a very small noise, a very small noise, such that after you add this small noise, the new image looks very similar by our human eyes, but the deep learning model will think this new image is uh, in a total different class. So here, the deep learning model will think this image is a mouse trap with very high accuracy. So this phenomenon was dis uh, was discovered maybe in uh, uh, about uh, say seven years ago, okay. and since then, many machine learning researchers are trying to think of how can we make the deep learning models or even some simpler machine learning models more adversarially robust, okay, robust against those adversarial noise. Okay. So any questions about this setup? Okay, cool. So now let's study how can we make an algorithm adversarially robust. Okay. So um, to, to see how can we make an algorithm robust, we need to first see how to attack, say, a deep learning model, such that after you add a small adversarial noise, okay, the deep learning model will be fooled. The way of doing the adversarial attack is uh, so is by looking at this simple algorithm. So typically in a deep learning model, okay, uh, we will try to optimize uh, some parameters by minimizing the loss function. Okay, so this is the uh, standard training process in deep learning models. Uh, what the adversarial example we're trying to do is instead of minimizing the loss function, they try to maximize this loss function. I found a small perturbation delta in the input okay, such that the loss function is maximized. Here, they use this epsilon to control the size of the perturbation. Okay, so typically, this epsilon is very small such that uh, the perturbed sample is quite close to the original sample. Okay, but the loss function, they want it to have a significant increase. So this is how people generate those small adversarial noise. Okay, so uh, any questions? Okay. So uh, naturally, given that adversarial attack, okay, we can then define the so-called adversarial loss function, which is simply the maximum of the loss function, okay, given this uh, constraint on the attacks. And given this adversarial loss function, then one way to make your machine learning model more, more robust is simply trying to minimize this new adversarial loss function. Okay, we try to minimize this adversarial loss function. And this is called the adversarial robust optimization in machine learning community. So the idea is very simple. We simply try to minimize a new loss function. But the optimization of this mean max problem turns out to be very hard. Okay. It was found that even for some simple models, such as quadratic models, this optimization problem is MP hard. Okay. So the computation and the theoretical analysis of this optimization is still largely unknown. But in practice, what people do is, is typically they will approximate this L by using first or second Taylor expansion and then use the so-called PGD or uh, FGSM to give an approximate solution to this optimization problem and gain a lot of empirical success. Okay. But still, uh, from the theoretical perspective, uh, this optimization problem is still very hard to analyze. Okay. So um, in, this, in the remaining of this talk, I will try to uh, give you some insight about this adversarial robust optimization. Before that, let us introduce a few terminologies. So first, we define an estimator or a solution, say, a, a theta epsilon mean, okay, to 
to denote the solution of the adversarial robust optimization. Okay. And uh, because of because we are trying to minimize the adversarial um, loss, so this theta epsilon is typically adversarially robust. Okay. This theta epsilon is robust. Uh, moreover, we define another estimator, the theta mean, which is simply the minimization of the natural optimization. Okay. So uh, typically, in general, this is not robust. We then define the so-called adversarial cost, okay, the cost of adversarial robustness by defining the, it as the difference between the loss functions evaluated on the theta epsilon and the theta mean. Okay, so this is the cost we have to pay in order to make an estimator to be adversarially robust. Okay, and from the definition, you can see this S epsilon, the adversarial cost is always positive. Okay, so this is the cost you have to pay in order to make your estimator adversarially robust. Uh, any questions? Okay, so this quantity is very important and it's the central goal uh, in the remaining of the talk. Okay. So the adversarial cost. This quantity turns out to be very interesting. In 2018, okay, um, a paper published um, by Maggi, okay, who is a famous uh, research scientist at MIT who studied the adversarial robustness um, very well. He found that the adversarial cost it has this following strange phenomenon. So he plot the adversarial cost or the accuracy difference against the model complexity. Okay, the model complexity is captured say by the number of features you use to train a model or the depth and the width of a neural network. So in, in their paper, they found that the adversarial cost when you increase the model complexity, the adversarial cost will increase first and then decrease. Okay, so it has this curve. This curve is very surprising. This curve suggests us that if now you have a simple model, okay, and you want your simple model to be adversarially robust, the suggestion is keep it simple. On the other hand, if you already have a very complex model, say a deep neural network, and you want to make the deep neural network more robust, okay, then the suggestion is that make it larger, make it deeper. Okay, so this is um, some implications we can get from this curve. But still, this curve is just an empirical observation, and we still don't know, say, uh, why this curve happens and uh, how can we analyze this curve in a theoretical way. So um, in our, our paper, we provide a theoretical view of this phenomenon. So um, the key observation made in our paper is as follows. We found that although the adversarial optimization, the, the optimization with respect to this L is very hard, but the difference, okay, the adversarial cost defined as the difference between those two loss functions, this analysis is much more easier. Okay. The reason is that we can use the very simple idea, Taylor expansion, to approximate this adversarial cost, this difference. By using the second order Taylor expansion, we found that this adversarial cost only depends on a quadratic term of the difference between those two uh, solutions, okay? So therefore, to facilitate the theoretical analysis, in our paper, we define a new term called adversarial influence function, which is inspired by the influence function in statistics, try to approximate the difference between those two solutions, okay? We define the AIF as the derivative of theta epsilon with respect to epsilon, when epsilon is quite close to zero. So after we define this AIF in our paper, we found that this AIF has a closed form as shown here. And as a result, with this AIF, we can then approximate the adversarial cost with a closed form okay, as shown here. 
Okay, so this is um, a very, uh, to me, it's a very nice result because it shows a closed form to approximate an NP hard quantity. Okay, and now let's see how can we use this result to explain the previous phenomenon. Let's first start with a simple model. So we assume uh, the true model. Uh, y depends on x linearly, and the true model has, say, capital M total number of features. Okay, and in the training model, we only use, say, the M features to train the model. And then by using the previous theorem, we are able to derive a closed form to approximate the adversarial cost. Okay, then using some Stirling formula to simplify this closed form, we found that the closed form is a quadratic function with respect to the little m, the training model complexity. Okay, and if we plot this picture, you will find that the curve is very similar to the previous empirical observation. Okay, so this is one result that shows that uh, our theorem can give you some insight of the previous phenomenon. Okay, uh, due to the time of uh, of this talk i'm going to skip the second more complicated model analysis uh, and uh, let me briefly mention how can we use um, the aif tools to analyze more adversarial robustness phenomena so another popular technique in adversarial robustness is that if you change a model okay um, you can add a little bit of noise on the input this is called randomization a randomized smoothing technique. If you add a little bit of noise to your input, people found that the adversarial cost will decrease with respect to the noise level. Okay, so again, this is an empirical observation and there's no much theory uh, behind it. Um, so uh, we can also use the AIF tool to analyze this phenomenon and derive some closed form. So we are able to derive a closed form like this and show that the adversarial cost will decrease uh, when you increase the noise level. Okay. And this also it has also some hidden connection with differential privacy, because as we talked before, the differential privacy is trying to make an algorithm private by adding noise, right? Here, we also prove that by adding noise, we can also make a model training process more adversarially robust. Uh, so I will skip this and uh, let me summarize the talk. So hopefully after this talk, uh, you will see the, the current area, area of AI is in need of privacy and adversarial robustness. Okay. All those, uh, both terms are quite important in the development of new AI method. And in this talk, uh, I talk about the cost of privacy and the cost of adversarial robustness. Uh, we can certainly use uh, our proposed general framework or the AIF tools to analyze more statistical models. For example, the density estimation, uh, non parametric regression, and the covariance matrix estimation, and so on. So, the final remark I want to say is that um, in the current, so, or in the past 10 years, when people try to develop AI methods, people always try to make the methods more accurate and more accurate. Uh, now, I want to say that when we try to make them more and more accurate, please also remember to make them kinder. So I will stop here and thank you very much for your listening. Thank you so much, uh, Lenyan. Well, uh, appreciate the, the wonderful talk. Are there other questions? You, so you showed for the um, for the high dimensional regression. It was it was a linear linear regression. When you consider the more general GLM, what changes? Oh, so for the upper bound, uh, there's not much change. So typically. So this, uh, the, the algorithm is the same? Uh, not exactly the same, because here for the gradient, uh, this is a gradient for the linear regression. Right? Right. But, but, yeah, but for the GLM, you should replace the gradient with the a more general uh, gradient descent. Mm -hmm. So the upper bound is largely the same for the GLM models. But the, the lower bound proof is very different. Okay. The, reason is, yeah, the reason is that we, in, in our paper, we propose a general framework to construct lower bound based on the privacy attacks. So previously that Q value mm -hmm. uh, is one example of the privacy attack or mean estimation. 
So for the generalized linear models or linear regression, we then need to uh, invent different privacy attacks to attack the estimation of beta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then because the models are very different. So um, the attack we proposed or we used is very different for those two cases. Andrew, can I also ask a, a follow-up? Uh, it's, it's, it's very related to Anand's question about this one in that, um, it, it, so if I take this method for the high dimensional regression to be rate optimal, I, I don't know this is perhaps not even right, but is there something that you can say about perhaps the effective privacy level that this method can achieve? If you have both the upper bound and lower bound, is it somehow indicating that this epsilon delta that you claim to have is in fact uh, somehow achieved by that. Is I'm also thinking about because you have that comparison with the different methods um, and how their uh, rates uh, compare. Um, these kind of comparisons, because I in my own research, I, I tend to find them to be very hard because you don't know, especially if this is a more than one dimension, you add you know multi-dimensional noise to that. Exactly what is the level of privacy that each of the methods actually have and then we're plotting you know them on the same picture how do you do you ha have you thought about that right so in my opinion uh for a fair comparison uh, so one is fix privacy level and compare the errors right so when you fix the errors um or, or when you fix the privacy levels um then different methods have their own uh, way to control the epsilon and delta Right, so given the, a certain epsilon and the delta, um, we use those different um, methods to add the corresponding noises and then compare them. So that's one way. So that's the, uh -huh. that's the, the point being that most of methods when they add a noise, especially if it's more than one dimensions, typically this is not the exact effective amount uh, level of privacy that they achieve. Typically they go more than conservative. Right. Yeah, so, so that's so why the starting the level, lower bound. Is, yeah, so that's why starting the lower bound is yeah. essential here. So we can see like what's the exact level of the noise we should add, and if the, a certain noisy addition mechanism is optimal in terms of convergence rate or not. So I guess maybe the question becomes maybe it's worthwhile to think about the lower bounds of the other methods as well, just so that mm -hmm. um, you know we're not lining up everything by their upper bound and and therefore some look exceptionally bad uh, because of that. Uh, I, I just find this kind of irresolvable when I when I try to think about this myself, which is why I'm asking <laughs> to see if you've solved right, it. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I think this is also a big problem, especially say for different algorithms. Uh, how can we compare, say, if we know uh, this algorithm adds this large noise and another algorithm adds this large noise, how can we compare their privacy level? So, that's, I think, a counterpart of your, your question. So I talk uh, about this question with Wei Jie because he has a paper on Gaussian differential privacy. And uh, we, we found that use their framework, uh, we are able to at least give some insight to quantify, say, how private an algorithm is. They're given a certain algorithm, uh, we can use the view from hypothesis testing to quantify how private this algorithm is. Yeah, so yeah, you can also look at their paper and uh, see how to use the uh, hypothesis testing framework to understand or quantify the privacy level of an algorithm. Uh, Thank I'm going to jump in yeah, here yeah. and say that in the interest of time, uh, let, let's tackle engine one more time. And uh, um, we will uh, resume the seminars uh, after the Thanksgiving break, our last one on December 2nd with Professor Salman Avestamir from uh, USC. Uh, thank you, Linjun, again, and everyone have a great Thanksgiving break.